The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys. Happy Wednesday. We are going to talk about an interesting topic today, and that is, is the dog ruining your relationship? That's good, one good we question. hear. That's one we hear quite frequently. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. And, and the I will... pig squeaker himself. So the tip of the day, what we have here is a tether bag. And if you have a puppy that's roaming around the house and having accidents, things like that. Um, what we recommend is we started using these. A lot of times we'll tell people, tie your dog to a doorknob with the leash or tie your dog to the leg of a big piece of furniture to just keep it in one place. And we're not saying to leave the house and tie your dog to a doorknob. But if you're in the kitchen working, it's nice if you can just put that leash on a doorknob to just kind of keep your dog in one place. So with this, if you have a big open floor plan, you can't put up the puppy gates if you don't have a doorknob or something to hook on, you can just put this anywhere you want in any room of the house. And you just clip the tether on it here. And you can just clip your puppy or your older dog on here if you have a, a newer dog that's having some issues with some destructive behavior. And it's just a way to manage the dog in the home while you're there, kind of supervising, coming and going from that room. And uh, that's it. It's a tether bag and a six foot um, cable tether to stabilize your dog. Yeah, and a lot of people like this topic about the relationships. If the dog is annoying to your significant other, your spouse, or something else, licking them at the end of the day, my dog, Scott, makes us breakfast. He's a very good breakfast chef. The whole time he's making breakfast, my dog's following him around. What are you doing, Dad? What are you doing? What do you need? What do you need? So he says, go put your dog away. Like, go put your dog somewhere. So my dog can stay in a bed, and that's great. But it's a great way to manage the dog without having to do obedience. And the thing about these yeah. is they're portable. So if you're going to the kid's game or something... You can throw it in the car and um, have it wherever you go. It's kind of like a stake in the ground. We'd recommend putting about 50 pounds of gravel inside of it. We just got a bag from Home Depot. but yeah, It depends on the size of your dog, but it's just a way to stabilize the dog and keep him from just roaming around. Yeah, and you know? while you have been working out, that one only has sheets in it. That didn't have 50 pounds of gravel. But they're um, a really nice solution. They're a really strong fabric. And uh, again, Oh, and you can bags. find them on the Canine Healing website also. Yeah, there'll be a link in the description. Okay, so... <clears throat> This topic was a Scotty topic, and uh, we've come across this kind of situation more than once in our careers. So, well, I, I just got another call this week, and I kind of that's why it kind of sparked this about you know a woman that's home with four very young children and a new puppy, and the puppy is making her life um, even more stressful than it needs to be, and the husband is away from the house and. The husband who's away doesn't think they need to do training, but yet the, the mom is there trying to manage this dog, and it's becoming, you know, a point of contention between the husband and wife, this young dog, you know? Yeah, so we have a few different scenarios of how this pops up, um, and the first one is exactly what Scott just discussed. So it's a shared dog. Um, you're either in a committed relationship or you're married or whatever it looks like, and there's this one person that's dealing with the dog and the dog's problems and they're home with the dog day in, day out. And then the other person is away during the day, comes home at night, enjoys the dog, doesn't see anything wrong with anything Let's going on. Let's the dog jump all over them and be yeah. misbehave and they love to see the dog. So quite more often than not, this is a husband and wife situation and the wife is at home pulling her hair out, can't stand the damn dog. She's trying to do a bunch of stuff with her life and can't get anything done because the dog's driving her nuts. And the husband, he might travel a lot. He, you know, might work long days. He's fine with the whole situation and doesn't see any need for training. Doesn't see the point in spending any money on training. Yeah. yeah. So what do we recommend for well, those people? Well, what I would recommend is, at the very least, look into some daycare. Like, get the dog out of the house during the day when you have a lot of stuff going on and, and this dog is driving you crazy. And uh, you're going to have to do some training and you're going to have to sit down with your partner, whoever that is, and say... Either we do some training here with this dog or the dog is going to have to go. It just depends because even the dog daycare is going to get even more expensive than training because that's just an ongoing, as they say, a continuity yeah. expense every month, every week. It's going to be 100 bucks a week for the rest of your life, you know? 
So the best thing is to get some training, and uh, but you're just going to have to have a sit down with your partner and, and say it's it's me or the dog kind of thing, you know? You got to <laughs> well, do it. And the thing about that is, you know, people say, well, oh, if I get the training and I go to training and we're not all on the same page, it's going to be a waste of money. Frankly, that isn't true at all. Like, you can have different rules with the dog than your husband does. You can have different rules with the dog than your kid does. Scott and I own dogs that behave differently for both of us. Like, if you lay down the rules and your dog knows, like, okay, she's not going to cave here. He's not going to cave there. And you just make a few things very important to you, maybe like crating, um, not jumping, not barking, whatever your situation is, that would work. So if your husband isn't, you know, willing to go to the training or whomever it is in your life, go by yourself. Like, yeah. just... Put the dog in the car and make it happen and make sure you're seeing some significant progress. And otherwise, if, you know, daycare and training aren't options and you're not going to get, you know, end your relationship over this, you might have to get rid of the dog. Yeah. And uh, not everyone has to be on the same page. And over the years, I've heard many trainers saying everybody has to be on the same page so that the dog doesn't get confused. And I've always used the analogy that when I was in middle school, uh, there was this group of kids. We went from one classroom to another. And uh, in one classroom, we were throwing spitballs or shooting spitballs and just being complete idiots with that teacher. And we'd go to the next classroom and the same kids would all be angels. We'd all be sitting there quietly. We didn't do a thing because the second teacher just said at the beginning of the year, if, if I hear one person talking, everyone's after school for a week. Sure enough, we were all after school for a week and we didn't say a friggin' word in that class after that. But when we were in the other classroom with the looser teacher, we all acted like idiots. So... Not all the teachers were on the same page, but the kids acted differently from room to room, you know? Yeah, and you just, you have to be consistent. And the thing is, if you're going to work with a trainer, you're probably going to get a ton of tips. Like, they're going to show you, hopefully, how to get your dog to come when called, how to get your dog to do loose leash walking, maybe get your dog to go to a bed, get your dog to accept a crate, sit down, maybe sit downstairs. There's a ton of information that you should leave with and be able to build upon and everything else. If you don't need a sit stay for a practical reason, that's fine. If loose leash walking is the biggest thing, then you focus on that. Like if you just take a few gems that can make your life easier, and that's why we had the bag be the tip of the day, because sometimes that's all we're talking about. It's There's just no not training having, involved. Yeah, not having a dog under your feet when you're trying to load the dishwasher, feed the baby, everything else. You or know, not having them chewing up. I'm sorry to, to no. step on your words there, but they could be in another room chewing up your shoes, you, and then you go into the other room, and you're all stressed out because now something else got damaged. You know? Yeah, and especially people, um, if you're working from home and your dog's noisy in a crate, or if you have kids and your dog is noisy in a crate and your kids are napping during the day, the last thing you want is that dog to be waking up the kid because it's whining or barking in the crate. So the bag is a nice alternative to those things. And there's answers, guys. There's always an answer. Um, normally, it lies within your own mindfulness, but when it comes to these things with relationships, we've seen it time and time again. And I would say this is our biggest um, scenario that we see most often. Which one is that? The one we just talked about. With yeah, yeah. The um, just one person home, one person not, one person thinks something has to happen, the other person says it's fine. But you know, you have to, if you're the person that's struggling, you need to cave and you need to make some changes and make something happen for the quality of your own life. Because we know dogs can cause a lot of stress and life is already stressful enough. Yeah. And if you're working from home, it's hard to get the work done. You, you got to be talking on the phone quite often. If the dog is barking, you can't talk on the phone. So you wind up just letting the dog do what they want to do because they're quiet, but they're not necessarily, you know, they're up to no good when they're being quiet. You yeah. Know? So another situation that um, I would say we see second most often is you have a new relationship and the partner doesn't like the dog. So um, or is I, afraid of the dog. Yeah. Maybe. So this is more. This is it was listed differently, but I think that this is um, more a common one. So we've seen this even with a few of our friends. We have a good friend who um, was widowed, and he's a very intelligent scientist, and he owns a working dog, and. His girlfriend was scared of his dog. Like, it's a working dog. It's scary. It was too forward with them. And he ended up, you know, getting out of the relationship. The woman didn't want to be with them. And that, the dog was more important to him than the girl. And that's fine. But, like, this kind of stuff happens. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it's your dog, you know, the person is going to have to accept your dog. And that's just the way it is. You come with the dog. Uh, I would not. And I say, you know. I have a friend out in California. She's probably going to listen to this podcast. But she called me with her dog was biting her new boyfriend. The dog had bit her boyfriend a couple of times. And uh, she decided to get rid of the dog. And uh, the dog was right. The dog, the guy was not a good person. 
and the guy wound up taking advantage of her and financially and doing a lot of you know bad things. And she called me after all that was over and said I should have gone with my gut and the, listened to my dog because the dog was had was a good judge of character, you know. But uh, I have another friend who has a dog, got in a relationship, and he lets the dog sleep in the bed with him. And the new girlfriend didn't like that type of thing. And he said, well, I guess we're not going to see each other anymore. That's all there is to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was over. So So if it's the person that doesn't like the dog that you own, or if you're in a relationship and you don't like the dog that the person that you're dating owns, um, maybe it's not the right person for you, for one. I mean, a lot of people aren't going to be willing to get rid of their dog. Another thing, uh, you could handle your dog a little bit differently. So just because your dog is your pet, especially if you have a working dog, Create your dog during dates. Create your dog during sleepovers. Create your dog during dinner parties. Like, you know, not frequently in a relationship is it a 24-7 thing right at first. And frankly, there's a lot of these working dogs that have very separate lives. They don't really have pet dog lives. So, you know, you can go exercise your dog and put them on a treadmill and do retrieves and everything else. And maybe there's some sort of kennel set up outside. And then, you know, when it's social settings, you create the dog. A dog may, like, lose some freedom if you really want to hang on to that relationship. And then... Um, make sure that the person, um, is around the dog without you sometimes. And this is what I was kind of coming up with myself and not so much if it's a working dog and you're afraid of the dog, but most people don't have a working dog. Most people have a companion animal. But for instance, if it's this, you know, dog that, you know, your partner really doesn't like, uh, say, Hey, I'm going to go run an errand. Can you stay here? I'm going to go get gas. And sometimes the person actually might like the dog more when it's not around you, because maybe some of the dog's bad BS behaviors have to do with your relationship with the dog and the anxiety is coming out with you and the neediness is coming out with you and everything else. So if they're able to kind of establish their own ground rules with what they want the relationship to look like with the dog, that might be a nice thing to do. Like they need their own personalized time with the dog. So it's not just this trio that we're trying to make everything work. Mix you and can, match. You can also have the new person uh, start feeding your dog meals too. Yeah. Which is a great way to start to establish a little relationship with this new person in the house. Yeah. Okay. So those are the two ones we see most frequently after the break. We have a few other scenarios for you. And we also want to bring you some solutions because we want dogs. We want love. And it's all important. So we're trying to help guys. Does your dog seem anxious? Would you like your dog to relax? Do you want to feel more in control? Would you like your dog to cooperate? HowToCalmYourCanine.com That's HowToCalmYourCanine.com Welcome back, guys. All right, so we covered the person that's home with the dog, can't stand the dog. Other person thinks the dog's fine, let it be. Then we covered if you have a new relationship and the partner isn't the one liking the dog. Well, what if the dog is the one not liking the partner? That alluded to a little bit what Scott was talking about earlier with that one dog that bit the person that she was dating. But what do you do if your dog just flat out doesn't like the person you're seeing? Any suggestions, love bug? Well, sometimes, you know, you should uh, take what your dog is telling you there and um, think about it. I mean, if you've had this dog for quite a while and you you have a good relationship with your dog and, and the dog doesn't like this person, I mean, these are good reasons to manage your dog, but um, I would do some obedience. I would do some obedience training and get this new person, if you really feel strongly about this person that you're seeing and... Uh, and your dog, for, for some reason, is having trouble warming up to them. I would get out and do some walking, walk, go for leash walks with your partner, this new person. And then while you're walking, hand the leash to your partner and let them walk the dog so that you can start to establish a relationship together. Because it may be that it, the dog is protective of you. It may be that there's nothing wrong with the, the new person in your home. It's just that it's the dog doesn't want to share you. It could be that, you know, it could be a lot of different things going on there, you know? Yeah. And if you're going to go to classes, then bring the person that you're seeing to classes. Because, I mean, similar to in-laws, like pets are kind of a make it or break it thing here. You know, if you have a dog that's three, that's going to live till it's 15, 
that your relationship that you're enjoying isn't likely going to turn into a marriage if the dog is really getting in between you guys in such a way that it's affecting the quality of the relationship and the quality of your own life. Um, if your dog is fearful and kind of aggressive with every single person it comes into contact with, and it's no different just because there's this new person in your life, uh, you want to do things like if the dog eats food, just let the person toss the dog food, but not even looking at it, not even squaring up on it. Just like, hey, this person comes around, I get food. Like the dog's on a leash, it's controlled, there can't be a bite, the fear can't control the dog, so the dog can't run away, but there's just no interaction. Like maybe for two weeks, like that's what it looks like. And then if that's going well, like Scott said earlier, you can take the uh, person and have the person feed the meal. Ideally, the food isn't out all day long, so now all of a sudden dinner's coming, breakfast is coming, snacks are coming, like hey, maybe this person isn't so bad because we get it. Like your dog is, you know, a single human dog and they're happy with you, but they just don't like anybody else. And for the most part, that doesn't make a big issue for people because they only have friends over so often and they can manage their dog. But getting into a relationship, that's a little bit more serious. So take some different steps there so everyone's feeling comfortable, but that doesn't mean that the person's now coming and swooping the dog up and putting it on its lap and really trying to get personal with the dog real quick. That's more of the harder part is someone that thinks they're a dog person yeah. and starts kind of imposing and pushing themselves on your dog and your dog isn't ready for that. That's, that's not a good thing, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, Scott came up with the situation of couples who do dog sports together and I don't know if yeah, we have a lot of, a little bit <laughs> I don't tough. know if we have a lot of solutions for those couples well, or, no, or one mean, of those couples. Um, but that, that's a little less frequent than probably the person who does dog sports like crazy and the partner could care less or the spouse could care less and we'll get there too. But people that do dog sports together, it's uh, stressful. Even if you're competing in two different sports, like if you're both trainers, there's some ways that you need to delicately yeah, approach if that. If you're training together, there's going to be some friction. There's going to be some heat. And uh, I've asked dozens, not dozens, but certainly a half a dozen couples it's one of the first things I ask them when they see they're training together and they could be very successful. It's not, you know, but I'll say, you guys train together all the time. Yeah. You ever have any issues? And they just start laughing. <laughs> oh yeah. They're just freaking the things, you know, it's just tough. It's an emotional thing. You got a dog, you have two different heads thinking about, um, maybe some challenges within the training and, uh, dog people are opinionated to begin with, especially, you know, a working dog dog sport people, you know, they're, we're strong personalities. And, um, so there can be some, some friction there, you know? Yeah. There's a good picture of Scott and I working as border collie Jimmy. Um, and he looks like he's telling me to get off his lawn. Like I'm some stranger, I'm working his dog. So I'll post that in the thread on the Facebook feed because it's always one of those pictures that circulates, uh, about once a year and we all get a good laugh out of it. But yeah, I mean, this is a thread on Facebook quite frequently and there's going to be friction. You want to approach training sessions respectfully, but of course you're going to talk to your partner, or your spouse differently than you're going to talk to a stranger. So, um, definitely if you're competing in the same sport, uh, with two different dogs and you're doing the own thing, like drive separately sometimes to the competition, like get in your own zone and, uh, kind of what? find that fine line. Who of the hell does that? I know that. quite a few people that do that. We don't compete with two different dogs in the same sport. We yeah. compete with different dogs in different sports. But if Scott's but, going to compete, I support him and his dog, and it's his day, and we can be together. But if I was also going to be going to the same trial and competing in the same venue with a different dog from the same household, I got to get my head clear too. Like, I'm not going to be pottying his dog while I'm the next one to go onto the field, you know? So create some separation there and do what works for you. And you'll see over time what works for you. And take a step back from this 24 7, you know, we're living together, we're training together, we're doing all this together. Like, have some alone time if need be, if that's what's going to make it work. We've done pretty well over the years, but it can be tricky in trying. Yeah, because I'm not the most, you know, emotionally mature person. So, <laughs> I mean, I'll have my little temper tantrums out there. I'm getting better over time, yeah, but he's, he's you know, a, he's I'm a less slow study. I'm less likely to have a temper tantrum in front of people that I don't <laughs> live with and I'm with 24 seven. Yeah. It's good when we're in public. Um, so what would happen more often than that is maybe you're obsessed with dogs and your partner could care less or your spouse could care less about the whole dog scene. They're not going to be going to trials. They're not going to be involved in the training and everything else. And normally this situation seems to go better because you're not on top of each other's toes all the time. But Frequently, maybe the person that isn't involved is kind of getting jealous that you're gone all the time, um, or you're kind of bummed that like the person never wants to see you train or doesn't ever want to come to competitions or anything like that. Yeah, I, I do know some people like that where I've never even met the spouse. People <laughs> I've seen in, in dog sports that are married, 
And I've just never met their spouse at all. They have a totally separate, their dog thing is totally separate from their spouse who has maybe something else, maybe they do scrapbooking or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. They each have their hobbies that they'd enjoy together. And that's probably healthier in the long run. Yeah. And if it works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if you are having issues with that type of situation, one thing I would say as the sport person, like you're, they don't have to care. Like that's okay. Like maybe if you'd like them to see you compete or like to see you do th something like maybe twice a year, you say like, Hey, can you come for this thing? But they don't want to sit there all weekend, all day. If you're not into it, it's boring yeah, as hell. I mean, it's yeah. almost boring as hell if you are into it sometimes, depending on what's <laughs> going on. I mean, like that's not fair for that person. Like you can't expect that of someone just because you love them that, Oh, they really need to like feel my passion and everything else. If you're a wife and your husband's hopped up on motorcycles, are you like, into that just because he's into that? No. I mean, it takes a person with a certain personality and everything else. So that's one thing. And then if you are the person that's, you know, a little bit upset that your spouse or your partner is always gone and always doing stuff with the dogs and feeling jealous and everything else, then ask to integrate yourself if you want. But then you can't bitch if it's boring too. You can't have it both ways. So that situation I'd say would come up more often than what we see a lot in our field where you're both involved in the sport and those personalities are both coming to it and you're both really engrossed in the competition and the sport and everything else. But you want to be respectful. And when it comes to the dog, people can get emotional quick. I mean, dogs really bring our emotions to the surface. I don't know what yeah. it is, but yeah. uh, I would frequently say, you know, we can be doing it at home with somebody that lives right on the ocean in Manchester, Massachusetts, and they have everything in the world. And like we know more than the nanny knows. You know what I mean? Like people have a hard time filtering themselves when it comes to the dog and the relationship and everything else, because it's just so raw. Like it's so interconnected with how you're often feeling and how it's affecting the relationship and everything else. And furthermore, the dog doesn't get a lot of outside influence. So the nanny isn't taking care of the dog. The dog isn't going to school every day and seeing other teachers. The dog isn't going to play with friends where the other dog moms are watching it. So it's really something that's the core of a lot of relationships because you guys are the only two people seeing the dog and now you're having trouble. And, you know, rather than point fingers, how can you actually progress forward to make this happen? And you have to be honest, like if your dog's behavior is an issue, like it's taking up the bed space or we've gotten a lot of those growling at the spouse in bed. That's a common one. Yeah, that happens all the time. It's like the husband will get up to use the bathroom and when he comes back to bed, the dog is growling at him. So he'll sleep on the couch instead of addressing that issue, you Which know, and then I, that's, I that, hate to laugh, but I mean, that like happens like, we've yeah, heard it seems that. ridiculous, but that's real scenarios we've that we that see a half many dozen times, times. Many yeah. times. And, um, you know, the dog thing on the couch, I mean, yeah. you could be on the couch and your spouse wants to come sit next to you and the, and the dog will growl at your spouse and it doesn't get addressed, you know I mean? And that's going to create a problem, but in your relationship. Yeah. Or you know? the dogs, once you have kids, you know, you, one person thinks that the dog and the kids should be integrated all the time. The other person doesn't want to see the dog just constantly licking the kid's head, something else. So like, if you have behavioral issues like that, it doesn't matter what scenario that falls in of what we've talked about, do something to fix that dog's behavior or manage that dog. So if it's just the growling thing at night in the bed, have the dog sleep in a crate outside of the bedroom. Like find a plan there where you can manage things. And Scott alluded to it earlier and it is true. Like you really need to look at your own intuition with these things. Like how do you feel about it? What is your gut reaction of what you feel about this new rescue that you brought home or this dog that you just met with this person that you're dating whom you really like, but the dog just gave you the wrong feeling. Like use your intuition, like let your gut talk to you about some of these things because more often than not, it's right. <clears throat> yeah. Trust yourself a little bit more. Everybody is second guessing themselves and on so many levels. And I've had, you know, many people come in over the years with a dog that just isn't, you know, wired right mentally, a, a rescue that they've had only for a short time. And I'll say, you know, we can get into some training. The dog is not right. You know, I'll evaluate the dog, work with the dog, and say the dog is nutty. And uh, where did you get the dog? Have you considered bringing the dog back? Because, it's a, you know, it's maybe a three-year-old dog. It's been in five homes. It's got a lot of issues. And they've only had the dog for a week. And, the, and they'll say, oh, you know, I, I thought about that. I just felt bad, but that was my gut feeling. But I just really i am so glad that you said that to me because – that's what they were feeling would, would be the right thing to do, but they were just afraid that they were giving up on the dog or something like that. Not every dog is the right dog for that household, you know, and 
uh, some of these dogs out there are not good for any household, you know, honestly. But, you know, they're far and few between. But they're out there and they're getting passed around to a lot of different houses, in and out, in and out, you know, and it's not right. And that's rightfully causing stress in relationships. That's not on you guys. Like, we get yeah. that. And I would say as just a parting note outside of trust your intuition, kind of know where you stand on this topic before getting into a relationship. So for instance, when I met Scott, I was totally fine to be single forever. I really didn't care. I wasn't like one of those people that was like, oh, I really need to be with someone and yada, yada, yada. But in my head, I thought, all right, if I did end up and I married somebody, I either wanted them to be totally hands off with the dog and not care at all and not be involved at all. Or I just didn't want them to negatively affect my training. So like, I didn't want them not to follow the rules that I laid out for the crate and everything. Hmm. Like, like in my mind, that was the criteria. It's funny um, you say that because I'm always undermining your training, <laughs> and spoiling well, your dogs. <laughs> well, you're doing it more from a perspective of getting me to be a better trainer rather than not actually knowing what I expect. Scott thinks it's funny when he can get my dogs to break, but he's not knowingly or unknowingly, I should say, going in and letting him do things just to let him act like pet dogs. But if you're on a dating site or something and you're, you know, pushing this must love dogs mentality, like from the movie, that isn't necessarily what you want to get into. Like now that person that you find may have a dog themselves. And now both of those dogs have to integrate your dog and this person's dog. Like know kind of your baseline of what you're willing to accept. Like my dog is going to sleep in the bed every single night of its life. And if the person I'm with doesn't like that, I won't be with the person. Fine. But that's your ground rule. Like, you won't be caught off guard now. Or if you're going to go date somebody, you normally date people that don't have a dog. This person does have a dog. Think in your head, like, all right, I don't want the dog jumping. I don't want the dog keeping me up at night. I don't want to have to care for the freaking dog. Like, know where you stand before you get involved so there's less stress later. Because the worst thing is when you're in a good relationship. You had some kids. They're super cute. Everything's going well. Your careers are going great. You get the dog. And now the dog is like going to be the ruin of your marriage. Like You didn't have a lot of trouble. And then all of a sudden you introduce this dog. But if you're getting into a relationship and the dog is affecting things, like know where you stand and know what you're going to allow and um, really just have strong kind of regulations there. And I think that'll help you moving forward. Yeah, just have some basic rules, you yeah. know, and if you're just getting together with someone new, tell them how you feel about your dog and how the dog is the priority over that person. If that's the way you feel. Yeah. And um, be upfront, be honest about it. Yeah, Scott always says uh, he liked my eating, that I was had a healthy appetite, but he also loved how much I love my dogs. And that was something that he thought was cool. So make sure that that person thinks that it's a good thing, not that you're batshit crazy and they can never see themselves with you. Yeah, I've definitely heard of, you know, guys get involved with a woman that is crazy about her dogs like you were. But they don't like dogs, and they just think it's friggin' stupid. Yeah. Well, it's not the right person for you. Just yeah. keep moving. Yeah. You know? Dogs are a long commitment, and a relationship is an even longer commitment, hopefully, if it's all done right and well. So dogs, dogs typically will be longer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, we will see you next week. Thanks for joining us. Grab the pig there, love bug. He's always slow when he smokes a cigar. Keep it quirky, guys. Bye. <laughs>